Okay, today's lecture is on supply and demand. And a quick list of, of objectives for today's lecture. Really just two kind of core broad objectives. We want to talk about supply curves and demand curves. I spend a lot of time on those. Talk about what they are and what causes them to move. And then talk about the concepts of producer and consumer surplus, uh, what they are and, and why do they matter. And that's really special for a, a welfare analysis. We focus on supply and demand at this stage of the lecture because most of, of, of this class is interested with how uh, resources get allocated within the context of a market economy. A market being a place where suppliers and demanders come together. Uh, so, you know, given it's really important that we kind of focus on what supply and demand are uh, at this early stage. We'll start with, with talking about demand, uh, in particular quantity demanded, which I abbreviate as just QD. Okay. And quantity demanded for a good or service. So, you know, we're talking about, you know, what's the quantity demanded for, you know, tomatoes you know, measured in pounds or gasoline measured in gallons or uh, that's kind of what we're talking about in, uh, when, when measuring quantity demanded. And as you might expect, uh, quantity demanded is, is a function of lots of different variables. Uh, price per unit being maybe the most important at, the, at this stage of the game. Uh, price per unit meaning that if we're measuring quantity demanded in, in pound of tomatoes, we're measuring prices in pounds per, you know, uh, price per pound. If we're measuring quantity demanded in, in, in gallons of, ga of, of gasoline, we're measuring pr uh, prices in price per gallon. And then, you know, income, of course, also uh, plays a role in determining our quantity demanded, our tastes and preferences, uh, as well as a lot of other variables as well. Again, at this stage of the game, we're going to focus exclusively on prices, and then we'll uh, elaborate uh, later on. We'll start our analysis by, constru by constructing a real simple, what we call demand schedule. And a, a demand schedule just shows the, the real basic relationship between price per unit, which I have in the first column here, I've, I've got gasoline as my example. Uh, so price per unit, so we're, we're talking about gallons of gasoline, so this is three fifty a gallon, this is $3 a gallon, all the way down to $1 a gallon, and the quantity demanded, also measured in gallons. So uh, at the price of three fifty a gallon, uh, I'm using arbitrary numbers here, but I've got a, a quantity demanded of 5 gallons, and maybe that's 5 million gallons, maybe that's 500,000 gallons. You know, we, we can scale that quantity up and down uh, any way that we want. Uh, and at a lower price for, let's say, a dollar a gallon, we see that, that the quantity demanded is, is much, much larger at 15 gallons. In each of these price quantity demanded combinations, I kind of I, I denote using a letter, so a, a point, so point A, point B, all the way down up to, to point F. And I, and I do that because in the next slide we're actually going to be uh, plotting these points to make uh, a demand curve. Now, there are two ways that we can interpret the information on this demand schedule. One way, which is kind of the most direct way, is that we look at price first and we solve for the, what we call the maximum quantity demanded. So one way of interpreting this, this schedule is to say, okay, well, at a price of 350, the maximum quantity demanded in the, in the Chicago area is five. And at a price of two dollars a gallon, the maximum quantity demanded is 11 gallons. And at a price of a dollar a gallon, the maximum quantity demanded is 15 gallons. Okay, so we start with, with price and solve for the maximum quantity demanded. Now, an alternative perspective, one that we're going to find actually to be quite useful, is you start with the quantity demanded. In particular, you, you start with the Q with unit and solve for the maximum price that the, that the market is willing to pay for that unit. So the maximum price that the market is willing to pay for the seventh gallon of gasoline is $3. The maximum price that the market is willing to pay for the 11th gallon of, of gasoline is $2. Okay, that maximum price that the market is willing to pay, we oftentimes refer to as the reservation price. It's, it's, it's the maximum price that somebody's willing to pay for the Q with unit. Now, in this course, in most instances, I'll be abbreviating reservation price with the term P superscript R. Okay, that's reservation price, the maximum price that someone is willing to pay for something. Now, if we plot those points, on a coordinate system where the quantity demanded is measured along the x-axis and, and the price per gallon is measured along the y-axis, we would get a curve after we connect the dots that looks something like this. Now, for, for expository purposes, I've just kind of shown two different points, point A and point E. And at point A, we see that at a price of 350, that's associated with a quantity demanded of 5. 
and at a price of 150, that's associated with the quantity demanded of 13. Okay. So that's point a, points A and E, uh, 350 and 5, and 150 and 13 from the demand schedule. Now, the first thing you should note is that this interpretation, uh, or these two interpretations that we just reviewed, can also be done on the demand curve. So on the demand curve, we have what we call, or what I call, the horizontal perspective, which is where you start with price and solve for the maximum quantity demanded. So st at a price of 350, the maximum quantity demanded is 5. Conversely, at a price of 150, the maximum quantity demanded is 13. Okay, so that's that's communicating the exact same information that the, that the demand schedule did just just visually. Hor horizontally, we have the other perspective, which which yields the reservation price. The maximum is to pay for the fifth gallon of gasoline is three dollars and fifty cents. The maximum uh, one is to pay for the thirteenth gallon of gasoline is a dollar fifty. Okay, so notice that the height of the demand curve, using this this vertical interpretation tells us the reservation price for that Q with unit. It tells us the maximum price that the market is willing to pay for that Q with unit. Now, all this translates into what we call the law of demand. Now, the law of demand is actually very, very, very important. Uh, and it's actually just fundamental. So you, you have to know this. And all that really is, is, is it, it's this law that tells us, well, you know, as, as prices go up, so as you go from a price of 150 to 350, we can expect quantity demanded to decline. So if prices go from 150 up to 350, quantity demanded goes, in this case, from 13 down to 5. Okay, so there's, a, there's an inverse negative relationship between price and quantity demanded. Or we could go the other way. If prices fall from 350 down to 150, uh, quantity demanded, we can expect to rise, in this case, from 5 out to 13. Okay? So that's, the, so that's the law of demand. just tells us that as prices go up, quantity demanded goes down. As prices go down, quantity demanded goes up. Now, we want to spend a little bit more time talking about why the law of demand. Seems intuitive, makes a lot of sense, but we need to talk a little bit about what the mechanics are behind behind uh, the law of demand and why the demand curve is actually downward sloping. And to do that, we're going to start by taking this horizontal perspective where we're looking at the height of the demand curve and treating it as the maximum price that buyers are willing to pay for the QF unit. Now, if we assume uh, that, uh, there are, that, that there is heterogeneity in buyers' reservation prices, and if we also assume that each buyer if they're going to consume anything at all, they're only going to consume one unit. Uh, then we're going to get a demand curve that looks like this, where you've got buyers that place a high value on gasoline, okay, way up here somewhere. So, so these are people that, or people or firms that place a high relative value on gallons of gasoline. Their maximum willingness to pay their reservation price is is very very high. And down here along the demand curve, we have buyers that place a relatively low value on gasoline, which means that, you know, for the Q with unit, their maximum is to pay, although positive, is much, much lower than that for these people up here. Okay? And there are lots of reasons why we might have heterogeneity in willingness to pay. Again, you've got taste, you've got preferences that, that are different across people. Uh, you know, for gasoline, as an example, you might have uh, city residents who who have, the, have various uh, commuting alternatives other than driving. Uh, so they might place a relatively low value on a price per, per gallon because they have so many other alternatives available to them. Conversely, you might have suburban residents who really have to drive to really you know, even get a cup of coffee in some instances, who place a very, very high value on, on, on a gallon of gasoline because they, they, they need it to you know, live their daily lives. Okay. Now, that said, we want to spend a little bit of time talking about why this demand. Why is it that when price falls, quantity demand rises? Well, look at it like this. Okay. At a given price, here, okay, we have a quantity demanded that we solve for, which is right here at the intersection of the price line and the demand curve. Now, at this price, okay, all the buyers that fall along the upper portion of the demand curve, okay, have a positive quantity demanded. That's because 
the reservation price, i.e. the height of the demand curve, lies above the price they actually have to pay. So what we have here is an instance where the coin made is Q because there are Q buyers who, are, who have a, a willingness to pay that lies above or is equal to the actual price in the marketplace. Okay. Now, all the buyers down here on this portion of the demand curve have a relatively low willingness to pay, which means that at a, this given price, which falls above their willingness to pay, they're going to stay out of the marketplace. Their quantity demand will be zero. Okay, so the third assumption that we need to make to kind of get this law of demand is that quantity demand is zero if the price in the market lies above consumers' reservation prices. And conversely, quantity demand is equal to one if the market price is below or, in this case, equal to a consumer's reservation price. Now, the, law, you know, the way that the law of demand works is that as prices fall, okay, so as this market price falls from P to, let's say, P prime, you see that the movement along the curve tells us that the new quantity demanded will be Q prime, a much, much larger number. Price falls, quantity increases, quantity demanded increases, movement down along the curve, increase in quantity demanded. Why is that? Well, as prices fall from P to P prime, they naturally fall below more and more buyers' reservation prices. These buyers right here previously were, were priced out of the marketplace. But now as price falls, they're in the market. Now the price is below the reservation price. They're actually willing to make a purchase. Quantity demanded, therefore, increases because there are more buyers in the market. And that, in a nutshell, is why we have a downward sloping demand curve. Okay. Now, once we have that concept down, we need to introduce this con this 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 new concept of res of of, sur of consumer surplus. And I'm going to make a, a distinction here between individual consumer surplus and uh, total consumer surplus. At the individual level, again, we're we're imagining that all along the, this this demand curve, there are, are all these individual consumers, and that the consumers up here have a relatively high willingness to pay, and that the consumers down here have a relatively low willingness to pay. And consumer surplus, by definition, at least for the, uh, for the individual, is the difference between what they're willing to pay, the height of the demand curve at their point, and the price they actually pay. Okay, So think of consumer surplus for the individual as that individual's gain some trade. Okay, as the gains from trade that they can extract from the marketplace by having the privilege to buy this commodity at that particular price that is below or maybe equal to their reservation price. Now, you know, now for a given price, clearly, consumers with higher reservation prices, i.e. consumer I in this case, will receive higher levels of surplus because they're willing to pay more relative to the price they actually had to pay. Whereas consumers with lower reservation prices will receive lower surpluses. Okay. And if you kind of imagine a world where all along the, this demand curve there are lots of buyers all along here, kind of an infinite number of buyers from uh, the intercept all the way down to the point where uh, the marginal buyer is, then we can kind of calculate what we call total consumer surplus, which is for the marketplace as a whole, is just kind of the summation of all those little horizontal bars, which will just kind of uh, translate into the area of this of triangle right here, this 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 blue triangle. Okay. Now, that's total consumer surplus. And uh, that just measures not an individual's gains from trade, but the market's, well, sorry, the, the consumer's gains from trade uh, when prices are at peak. Okay, and it's just the summation of all the little individual consumer surpluses. Okay, now the, what's nice about depicting consumer surplus in this fashion is that you can measure the area of a triangle relatively easy, easily if you have just a little bit of information. So you know, information. For instance, I'm going to give you the actual quantity demanded. I'm going to give you the actual price. I'm going to give you the actual y-intercept, and then from there you can calculate the area of a triangle, which is just 
base times height divided by 2. So the base of the triangle is 70. The height is uh, 120 minus 30 is, is, is 90. So 70 times 90 divided by 2 is, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, 3,150. So total consumer surplus, which, which is a measure of the welfare gains flowing to consumers at this particular price, is measured in dollar terms uh, at 3,150. Uh, graphically, kind of the, the heuristic that I like to use to, to, to identify where consumer surplus is, if, because it's not always as, as straightforward as this, although it, in this class it'll almost always be the straightforward, is, is the area below the demand curve. Okay, so it's the area below the demand curve, which is just the area below the reservation price in the market. It's the area, it's the area above price, okay, so up, in this case the area above P, and up to the quantity consumed, which in this case is 70. So it's the area below this line, above this line, and up to Q right here. So it's this blue triangle right here. All right, now, remember, as we kind of indicated in, in earlier slides, that quantity demanded is not just a function of price. Now, for our purposes, and for the purposes of this entire class, we're always going to have price on the y-axis, OK? So the demand curve itself already incorporates or already embodies that relationship between price and quantity demanded. So when prices decrease, and as a result, quantity demanded increases from P, you know, P down from P to P prime and Q up to from Q to Q to, uh, to Q prime, that's what we call movement along the curve. We're, we're moving along the curve because the curve already embodies that price quantity relationship. Now, a movement of the curve or a, a change in demand, okay, is going to be de depicted by actual movements of the curve. And there are really two ways that the curve can move. It can move up and to the right, which we call an increase in demand, or it can move down and to the left, which we refer to as a decrease in demand. Now, an increase in demand okay. also has this, this horizontal and, and vertical interpretation. On the, on the horizontal end, we talk about for a, for a, for a given price, P, quantity demanded now increases. So at a price of P, Q, but now it is Q prime. Okay, so we, we move from demand curve D to the demand curve D prime. Conversely, taking the, the vertical perspective, for the Q with unit, the max points to pay was P, but now it has increased to P prime. Okay, so it has increased. The reservation price has increased. That's an increase in demand. For a given price, you're now willing to, to buy more. For a given quantity, you're now willing to pay more. Okay, that's an increase in demand, a rightward, upward shift of the curve. A downward shift of the curve, uh, a downward, inward shift of the curve, which is a decrease in demand, just has the interpretation that, you know, horizontally speaking, for a given a, a, a price P, Quantity demanded used to be Q, but now has it has fallen to Q prime. So there's a decline in the maximum quantity demanded that you're willing to bear. Conversely, uh, at a given quantity, Q in this case, whereas you used to be willing to pay at most the price of P, now you're willing you're only willing to pay a price of P prime. So the maximum price you're willing to pay has declined. That's a decline in demand, a decrease in demand. Okay, so again. Two ways to kind of uh, interpret what the demand curves are telling you, horizontal and vertical. Now, kind of fleshing out uh, that function from earlier on, uh, there are, well, five variables that we want to focus on in this class that actually shift the demand curve. Income, okay, so a consumer's income will shift the curve, and changes in income will shift the curve. The number of consumers in the marketplace itself will, will shift the curve. The price of related goods and services, if they move, could potentially shift a demand curve for a, the demand curve for a particular commodity. Expectations about future incomes, future prices, and tastes and preferences. Okay. We'll start with talking about income. Now, when we talk about income changes, um, we first need to identify, identify two different uh, categories of goods as they relate to uh, income. There are normal goods and there are what we call inferior goods. Normal goods, okay, 
experience an increase in demand, in quantity demanded, when incomes rise. Okay, so they're normal. You get more income, your, your point demanded for those commodities increases. Conversely, if your income declines, your, your point demanded for those commodities will also fall. Your, your, your demand for those commodities will fall at a given price. Okay. Now, inferior goods, <clears throat> inferior goods have the opposite interpretation. Uh, these are commodities where the quantity demanded declines as income increases. And conversely, as income falls, your qu the quantity demanded actually increases, holding all is, qu all, all, all is constant. And you know, we call these inferior goods because they typically have this uh, trait uh, associated with them that they're you know, lower quality, uh, less desirable, which means that you know, only lower income households, when they don't have many, many other uh, options, uh, oops, and um, yeah. So you know, just some some quick examples here in, in, in terms of changes of income. So for a for a normal good, if your income rises, you're going to see an, an upward and outward shift of the demand curve. That's an increase in demand. Again, it just means that if, if prices stay constant, the quantity demanded will rise if income rises. Uh, but for an inferior good, if your income rises, your demand curve is actually going to shift inwards, which means that for, uh, as your income rises. Holding prices constant, you're actually going to demand less. You're, you're going to demand less ramen noodles if, if you have more money, because they'll be dining out more instead, spending more money on that normal good. Uh, the number of, of of buyers clearly influences market demand. If you just have more people, you're going to have more quantity demanded at any given price. So you know, right? Uh, the price of related goods this is probably the 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 trickiest one uh, to deal with, only because only because there's so much. Oftentimes when the price of related goods changes, our quantity demanded for a particular commodity changes as well. Uh, and when I talk about related goods, I'm really talking about substitutes and complements. Okay, now, using lay definitions, a substitute in consumption would be, uh, uh, or substitutes in consumption are commodities that can be easily exchanged for one another. So think of you know tea versus coffee if you're interested in consuming caffeine, Coke versus Pepsi if you're interested in consuming a cola product, uh, regular versus premium gasoline if you're interested in consuming uh, you know uh, gasoline for your automobile. These would be substitutes in consumption. You can easily exchange one for the other and not incur major costs. Uh, Complements in consumption are goods that are consumed together. If you consume one. There's a, there's a good chance that you're consuming the other, and maybe you even have to consume the other to consume one. So, for instance, I think of uh, uh, college courses and textbooks. Now, I know a lot of you don't always follow this rule, but typically, you know, if you want to do it right, if you're going to enroll in the class and take the classes, you know, and, and take the credit hours, you're also going to be buying a textbook as well. Uh, you know, left shoe, right shoe. Uh, you, you know, computer and a computer keyboard. You know, lots of things that we can we kind of consume together. Um, the economic definitions, as opposed to those lay definitions, are, are are a bit more involved. When talking about substitute, okay, two goods are considered to be substitutes in consumption if the price of if an increase in the price of one leads to higher demand for the other, or vice versa. Decrease in the price uh, of one leads to Decreased demand for the other. Okay, so here I have the example of two commodities, I and J, and you know if the price of I increases, the demand for J will also increase. Conversely, if the price of J declines, then the demand for J will also decline. Graphically, uh, I've got this example here for substitutes where I have premium gas and regular gas, where you know if the price for premium gas declines, that's a movement down along the demand curve. And we see that there's an increase in quantity demanded from P, from P, from P uh, I'm sorry, uh, as price declines from P to P prime, uh, there's an increase in quantity demanded from Q out to Q prime. So we'll see that holding the price of regular gasoline constant, okay, and the price of premium gas falls, and people start to use more premium gas, the demand curve for regular gas will actually decline, actually move to the left like this, okay. Now, complements are goods. Uh, excuse me, complements in consumption are commodities that are consumed together. So in this case, if the if the price of one commodity rises, and there's a decrease in the quantity demanded of that commodity, 
you're probably also going to see a decrease in the demand for the other commodity, even if its, if it's price has not actually changed. So uh, you know, think of a case where you've got you know, textbooks and, and, and college courses. Okay? If the price per credit hour at NEAU declines, uh, it's not unreasonable to expect the quantity demanded for courses at NEAU to eventually increase. Okay, so if the college drops the price per credit hour from you know three hundred dollars to two fifty, you know, we may have students taking more classes and even have an increase in enrollment. Okay, uh, so that's an increase in quantity demand, the movement along the demand curve for courses at NEIU. What is that going to do to the demand for textbooks? Even if the price of textbooks doesn't change, well, more people taking classes more textbooks being, uh, being demanded. So even if we hold the price of textbooks constant, we're going to see a, an outward shift of the demand curve because there's a higher quantity demanded now because there are more students. Okay. So that's kind of how, how uh, the price of related goods influences, influences um, uh, a demand curve. Now, the last two I'm just going to talk about real, real quick, like, um, the first is, is expectations, you know, and, and how do expectations for the future influence our quant our demand today for something? Okay, so think of the demand curve today for something. How do our expectations for the future influence our demand today? So first off, let's talk about prices. If we expect prices to be lower in the future, then what's going to happen to our demand today for something? Demand is going to drop. Is going to drop today because. A lot of us are, are going to be willing to wait and wait and wait till the, the prices fall, and then buy the commodity as opposed to buying it now when prices are higher. Conversely, if prices are expected to increase tomorrow, you might see an increase in demand today. Okay. Now, if a commodity is is a normal good, and you expect your income to increase in the future, we might very well see an increase in demand today for that commodity. And last but not least, preferences. Your preferences always play a big role. Uh, you know, and this is what marketing is all about. You know, tastes change and, 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 and vacillate over time. Headlines that, you know, they're a little dated now, but, not, but, but, but still they, they, they still convey a point that, you know, you know a, f a food recall might very well influence my preferences and therefore my demand for eggs, even if the price of eggs hasn't changed.